I heard some challenges in that first uh, panel discussion, some challenges to the private sector. So uh, it's good timing that uh, we have that panel coming up right now. And um, this panel is chaired by Shane Coughlin. And Shane is one of those people I mentioned in the beginning, one of those people that uh, you can't stop from collaborating and innovating. Um, Shane. Thank you indeed. So I'd just like to invite my panelists to uh, take the stage here. Uh, if you could take a seat and we will shortly begin the second panel. So ladies and gentlemen, Today we're going to be talking about what does open innovation mean for the European ICT market? Obviously a small and easy to answer question. Uh, when we say open innovation, for the context of this panel, what we mean is the big umbrella ther term. We want something that covers open source, open standards, open access, open data. We're going to do a lightning tour of the topics here. On the panel today, we have some great thinkers that will help give us the big picture all the way down to specifics. Hello. <laughs> so I'm um, just introducing people in the order in which I will ask them to speak. We have uh, Keith Bergold, the CEO of Open Innovation, uh, Invention Network, uh, here talking about innovation in IPR, the big picture of how do you innovate around intellectual property. We are going to then hear from Mike, uh, uh, Mike Bohannon from Red Hat talking about cloud and innovation. Then we're going to hear from Dr. Matthias Kaiserworth uh, talking from IBM Research about four technologies that will change the world. And finally on specifics, Thomas Ulin talking from MySQL's perspective, an open source success story. To kick it off, because time is quite limited, Let's do the big picture of open innovation. Uh, we're going to get Kit Bergol to take the stage for a few minutes to give us a few words on how you do open innovation in intellectual property management. Assuming the slides will work. <laughs> Okay, while the slides are put up, uh, I'm just going to let you know that after everyone talks, we're going to take questions. Thanks very much, and thanks to uh, Shane, and thanks to Graham for the uh, kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, eight years ago, IBM, uh, in combination with Red Hat, Novell, Sony, NEC, and Philips, had the, uh, the awareness that we were witnessing something quite significant. Uh, it was actually probably dates back to 99 that IBM made its first billion dollar investment in, uh, in Linux that uh, their awareness actually came to, to the fore. But I think what they recognized together is that uh, we, were, we were witnessing a phase shift in the way that we collaborate and compete uh, among companies and across economies. And we had a uh, kind of a unique situation that uh, that presented itself with the first major uh, effect from litigation, the SCO litigation from uh, the early part of the last decade actually provided a wake-up call to these companies, recognizing that because there was no one company that, rep that represented Linux uh, and that open source was such a powerful dynamic that was changing the way we actually created value in the new economy, uh, they also, I think, explicitly understood that it's a social phenomenon. And the prior panel, I think, this was this was was reinforced: is that open source is about uh, a social phenomenon of collaborating uh, together and uh, cross organizationally and cross culturally. And once you actually let the genie out of the bottle and you move away from the 1960s. Uh, almost uh, inhumane uh, approach that we had, which was which discouraged uh, coordination and any discussion among competitive companies for fear that there'd be a Justice Department uh, suit for uh, undue collaboration and unfairness to ultimately the uh, pricing and and uh, availability for customers, and so we moved away completely, and now we're in a realm where the opportunities to, to collaborate are so significant that we're creating a dynamic which is threatening to those companies that don't support openness and collaboration. So what I'll talk to you about is how OIN was developed and how it actually serves to be able to support and enable uh, and steward uh, openness and, uh, and basically choice for customers, suppliers, 
vendors and partners. Uh, OIN is essentially a model that was developed, as I said, eight years ago by companies that recognized that SCO and similar lawsuits could be used by companies who are antagonistic to Linux and open source. Uh, because of their uh, commitment to, or, or belief that uh, that incremental innovation was good enough uh, and their comfort level with, with monopolistic and duopolistic uh, environments. We now moved to an environment in, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, actually 20 years ago with the, the advent of Linux, where we started to see that something was changing, and that something was that that we were now moving toward an, toward an environment where we were creating at a more virulent level than we'd ever had, we ever had in the past. What OAN does is essentially acquire patents and make them available on a royalty-free basis. Uh, what we're looking to do is create a patent no-fly zone around Linux and open source and give people choice. Uh, and if the choice is for an open source and a Linux-based project and products that come from that, that's great. If the choice is for a proprietary platform, then so be it. Uh, we think that the ability to distill the collective intelligence of literally thousands of people, uh, hundreds of thousands of people that are active in, in projects around the world, actually will provide a difficult uh, 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 path for for companies who are closed to actually compete with. So what OIN does is, does is acquire patents. Uh, we also invent, we participate in something called directed invention activities. Uh, we have over 600 patents and applications globally, over 400 US patents and applications. We invent 40 to 50 uh, patents a year. We, that's what we file. We've also introduced, taken a page out of IBM's history, back dating back to the early 70s by producing defensive publications. This is an incredibly diverse uh, and sometimes uh, paranoid community that uh, I represent as, as a constituency. And that constituency needs, needs a vehicle to be able to codify what it's invented. The creativeness of the first 15 years of Linux, where most of the developers actually were outside of large companies, was, was lost in terms of prior art, uh, because we have lots of code, but it's not searchable as an effective form of prior art uh, right now. That's something that some companies are working on, but uh, not materialized as yet. So as a result, for the future, we're encouraging the use of defensive publications. We're essentially our claim patents that allow statements of prior art to be out there so that if we had done this from the 1990s, we would have tens of thousands of, of uh, statements of prior art that would help with the quality issue that we have in the patent system, helping raise the bar on what is in fact patentable and what is in fact uh, uh, worthy of being a, uh, a patent. Um, so that's one program we're working on. We're, do, we're talking to companies and working with them to implement defensive publication programs. We create a cross-licensing commitment around our portfolio so that if you take a license to OIN for free, you have two obligations that are elements of consideration. One is that you agree to cross-license your patents that read on the Linux system definition. The other is that you agree to forbear litigation against uh, in Linux, in Linux-related areas. Uh, so really, OIN is a, is a series of industrial companies that had the foresight to put tens of millions of dollars into a fund, and they get nothing unique out of it. They sign the same license that every ordinary individual company or individual that approaches us signs. Uh, so it's a, it's, there's probably no precedent in technology for OIN's existence. Uh, but because of this phase shift that we're at in, the, in society in terms of moving from from closed and partially open to fully open, we've changed the, the we've, it's almost required that something like this would be created to really be the patent conscience and the patent guardian, uh, the guardian of patent freedom for the open source community. So we've also developed programs, we've utilized peer to patent as a model to be able to help uh, identify prior art on published applications so that they